icon. If you will remain standing for the reading of God's word. Well, I never did a theater in high school, but after that costume change, if you did, I respect you. I literally finished and I was like, okay, I'm good to go. And then I was like, my face, Mike. So I was back there. So, all righty. Well, if I've not met you yet, my name is Josh. I serve as the lead pastor here at Icon, and it is a joy to be with you today. And uh, Easter Sunday is one of those rare Sundays where I just get to go for it. And so uh, we're going to get into it today. So our scripture reading for today comes out of Mark 15, starting in verse 42. And when evening had come, Since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who is also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, he granted the corpse to to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint the body of Jesus. And very early, on the first day of the week, When the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, I just want to pause right now. I know myself and I know so many of my friends here have had a busy morning, getting things ready, getting the kids ready, getting in the car, compiling everything we need to do in order to to come to a service. And I just want to pause right now and thank you for your resurrected son, Jesus Christ. We'll explore so much of what that means for us today, but we just wanna start off in praise. Thank you that your son could not be held by death. And I pray that today as we explore some of the big realities and implications of, of what that means for us, God, I pray that you would give us astonishment. I pray that you would seize us with a sense of wonder and awe and even a joyful trembling and all that it means for Jesus Christ to be raised from the dead. And so, Father, in that, would you unite your power with my weak words and give us a sense of awe this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus has risen from the dead. Let's open with a relevant and understandable question. What in the world are we to do with a sentence like that? Jesus has risen from the dead. Well, friends, in in dealing with a sentence like that, it's important to remember how words can only be heard within the framework that we already have. Words, this is an obvious statement, are placed in sentences. (laughs) And sentences make up our stories, and stories find themselves within our worldviews. And often, without us noticing it, we interpret words from a a top-to-bottom framework. That we have an operating framework, we have a, a system by which we view the world, and that system 
interprets for us every story we hear, every sentence we choose to listen to or not. And this top to bottom interpretation through worldview is important when we're considering a sentence with such power as Jesus has risen from the dead. (laughs) And my guess is that there's a a number of interpretations, a number of different worldviews and how we think about that in this room, and then therefore a number of reactions to that sentence. Some of us, when I say that, are understandably skeptical. We're, We're cynical even. To to think of someone not just having a near-death experience and not only dying and then being resuscitated, but actually dying and then three days later come back to life, that seems far-fetched. I mean, to put it generously, even unbelievable. But to to the skeptic in the room, I would simply invite you to to analyze the evidence. The fact of the matter is that regardless of how unwilling we might be, we have to deal with the question of Jesus' resurrection, even if we're skeptical. There, there, there's no denying it. That our, our world has certainly turned secular beyond what sociologists would have even predicted 10 years ago. We live in a secular society, but our secular society is still operating off of the fruits of Christianity. Every impulse for justice that you have, every reaction that gives priority to love is all an inheritance from the line of Christianity. Our society wants the kingdom of God without its king. And so living in a society that is so dependent, even in its fierce secularism on Christianity, I believe it requires you to do the investigative work of what happened to make Christianity take off. Since you live in the benefits of what Christianity brings, it's, often, it's honestly dishonest to live life never considering why Christianity even began in the first place and took off. And so friends, when you hear me say, if you're skeptical that Jesus is risen from the dead, I would invite you to look at the evidence. And the evidence clearly points in the direction of a resurrected Jesus. No other explanation, and there's been a lot of them given, jives with the evidence better than a risen Jesus. That cowards who ran when Jesus was crucified would all of a sudden turn into willing martyrs, ready to give their life. That someone like the Apostle Paul, a fierce enemy of Christianity, would eventually turn into its greatest missionary and evangelist. Or consider this one, this one always gets me, Jesus' own brother, (laughs) James, turns into an apostle who will worship Jesus. I'm a younger brother, I know what it's like to have an older brother. And let me tell you, the only thing that could get me (laughs) in my competitive nature with my older brother to worship him and even die for him like James did would be to see him raised from the dead. (laughs) That's it. Something must to have happened. And the best explanation is the resurrection. The resurrection has consistently shown itself to pass the two tests of a historian, showing that it's not only a sufficient explanation for how the world history turned out with Christianity, but also a necessary one. And so I invite you, even as a skeptic, examine the evidence when you hear that sentence, Jesus has risen from the dead. And yet other, others of us, when we hear that sentence, aren't so skeptical. We don't interpret it through a skeptical lens. Maybe we grew up in church, or maybe we've become a a disciple of Jesus ourselves, and so the sentence, Jesus has risen from the dead, brings with it all kinds of warmth, and we might spout back real quick, he is risen indeed, yes. All of us have some sort of reaction to that sentence. When you hear Jesus has been risen from the dead, you have an interpretation. And because of that interpretation, you have a reaction. We all have it. But friends, here's what's messed with me this week. Very few of us have the reaction that we see here in the Gospel of Mark. 
Some of us are skeptical. Some of us are slightly moved. But these women are seized. They are held captive with astonishment. And that, that's the reason I love this account of the resurrection. It doesn't, it doesn't play around or speak nicely about a cold spring morning where the women were pleasantly surprised that their once dead savior is now alive. No, to these first eyewitnesses, the resurrection was something that seized them with astonishment. They were simply going about their business, paying homage to their dead leader, giving the body the dignity of spices to anoint the body so it's not degraded into the stench of death. And to them, it was just another day in the sad reality that they had been forced into because of the crucifixion and death of Jesus. In other words, they were not expecting this. And so the moment that it became clear to them, the moment that the resurrection of Jesus was announced to them by this angel, astonishment, trembling seized them. What could this mean? How, how could this be? The first time that that sentence was spoken, Jesus has risen from the dead. The reaction wasn't acute and kitschy, he is risen indeed. No, the, the, that sentence, when first spoken to these women, it went into their minds. It stirred up their imaginations. It enlivened their imagination. The transformative power and life-altering consequence hit these women like a ton of bricks, and they were astonished. They couldn't get over it. <laughs> they were seized, and they'd seen that everything must have changed. And my hope today, friends, is to help us recapture some of that astonishment together. <coughs> Rather than another Easter holiday on the calendar, my hope is that we see together with fresh eyes what it means to say Jesus has risen from the dead. And so to recapture this, uh, this astonishment, I want to do something really simple. This text that we read is kind of the thematic feel of our sermon today. We want to be gripped by trembling and joy and be seized by the astonishment of the resurrection. But what I want to do toward that end is actually go through together three implications of the resurrection of Jesus. And now these, these implications are, in many ways, Christianity 101. But if we really receive them and let them have their way with us, I believe we can walk out of this room with the same astonishment and even joyful trembling that, that these women had here. Okay? That's where we're headed. Take a breath with me. Take a breath with me real quick. Because we're going to dive in. Implication number one. Victory over death. The Apostle Paul makes clear this implication in 1 Corinthians. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The announcement of the resurrection of Jesus is, this is obvious, an announcement of the victory over death. Jesus has won the war. Now, now, victory over death, if I'm completely honest with you, I find it a strangely hard thing to preach. And, th and this is because of how people often receive it. Most of us are, are not close to death. Most of us have not even been severely hit by its sting from the losing a loved one, maybe. And so saying that there's victory over death can quickly turn into a platitude that's just easy to assent to. Yeah, sure, there's victory over death. Because we feel so far from death, the victory over death doesn't seem as seizing. And yet for some of us, we are very close to death. Whether close ourselves or close because we've been severely stung by the pain of a death. And yet even for those of us who are in that category, who are close to death, the announcement of the victory over death often feels 
like a hope that is too good to believe or a, or a relief that's far too far in the future to actually bring comfort. But regardless of how we initially hear that sentence, whether it's an easy platitude or as a distant hope, it should eventually shock us into astonishment that Jesus has the victory over death. Death is the one great enemy. It's the one great equalizer. It's the unifier of all humanity. We all know death. We will all experience death. And each one of us, to some degree, fears death. But despite its universal experience, we should know something important. Death is not natural. Death is not natural. In the Christian worldview, death is an invader. It's an, an, an intruder upon God's good world that in the beginning, the world God had made and the reality that he had constructed was ruled by life. We were meant to live with God and with each other in indestructible life. The human experience was not meant to be touched by death. And yet, at the entrance of sin into the world, death came rushing into every person's experience. An intruder has taken over the world, and so now death has become the universal human experience. Have you ever sat down and considered the weight to think of that? That death is the norm. In our sinful, fallen world, death is normal. That's a weighty thing to consider, friend. Not just for our own current society and our own current culture, but for as far back as human beings can ever remember, death has been there. Death has been taking us. Death has been the norm. You know, I, I, I think about death probably more often than the average person, a little bit of a dark soul whether because of my anxiety or because of some sobriety about my frailty, I think about death a lot. In fact, I used to have a practice, and it's based off of a Bible verse. I'll talk to you about it afterward if you want more. But I used to have a practice in my early 20s where I would go to graveyards and just walk around. I just walk around and look at the headstones. Not because I was a creep, but because at, at that time, at 21, I wanted to see, oh, that person was 21. That person was 23. That person was 25. And it always struck me walking around those graveyards, being shocked at how normal death was for all of human history. This is just what we do. We live lives, some long, some short. And then eventually our body gives out and we get planted in the ground. That's been the story, the narrative of human existence for literally as far back as we can remember. And yet, in that ruling world of death, in comes the resurrection of Jesus. And the storyline, the entire direction of the story gets flipped on its head. Of course, death today is still an inevitable experience for us, at least right now, but the experience itself has changed. Because of the resurrection, the finality of death has changed. No longer is death final. No longer is it absolute. But rather, Jesus has overcome the finality of death in his own person and promised that he will bring that same relief to us. The absolute nature of death has been taken away from it. And Jesus now holds the keys of authority to determine the end of death itself. Listen to how the Apostle John speaks of this in the book of Revelation. Jesus, speaking to John, says this. Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Do you hear the change in what Jesus says? He is alive forevermore. Death is no longer final, but is actually limited by Jesus. 
Not, death cannot touch him any longer. But not only that, Jesus says that he has the keys to death, which means that he has the authority. He holds the authority of when to release us from death. That he has the authority to unlock that cell. I've shared this in the past, but I've been to jail twice in my life. And I can tell you, it's a different experience. It would be a different experience walking out of that cell because I'd paid my dues. Don't worry, it was just speeding tickets. <laughs> to be able to walk out of that cell and be free, it would be different for me to walk out of that cell and to have the keys, to be able to go around and say, here you go. Here you go. That's an authoritative stance. And that's what Jesus is saying here, that he has the authority. Not only has he walked out of the cell of death, but he now holds the keys in order to free who he likes. Jesus is handed the authoritative keys in order to determine how death will operate. And more importantly, how long death will last. In his victory, he is determined that death will no longer be permanent, but rather there will come a day where he will place into our experience the same resurrection he himself has had. Jesus has a victory over death, and that should seize us with astonishment. Implication number two, sins are actually forgiven. Again, here, here's the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says this in 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Were you even found to be misrepresenting God? If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Summarize that thought. A dead savior is no savior at all. Now, why, why, why is this true? A dead savior is no savior at all, precisely because of the connection between sin and between death. Sin and death are intimately related, and the scriptures show that sin comes first and then actually brings death. Like I said in my last point, that sin came into the world and then death followed. And in many ways, death is the great weapon of sin. That sin is a tyrant that rules over humanity, and its greatest weapon is its greatest consequence, death. Now, as we explored on Friday during our, our Good Friday service, obviously the cross of Jesus Christ is all about him dealing with our sin. In, cross, in the cross, Jesus pays the price for our sin, taking our place. He overcomes the power of sin by absorbing it himself and deals a decisive blow to the power of sin. We can, we can look at the cross and we can see that. But how could we ever say that Jesus has dealt with sin and overcome it if he never removes its greatest weapon, death? If Jesus cannot overcome the weapon of sin, which is death, how can, he, how can we say he overcame sin at all? A dead savior is no savior at all. But in the resurrection of Christ, the final claim of Jesus that it is finished is given complete credibility. We can know that Jesus has finally dealt with your sin, has finally dealt with your guilt precisely because he he, he proves it in overcoming its greatest weapon in death. As, as the Dutch theologian Herman Bobbing says, listen to this, this is so good. In Jesus' exaltation, he completes the building for which in his death he laid the foundation. The resurrection of, of Christ is the amen of the Father upon the it is finished of the Son. Friends, the resurrection is the demonstrable proof that the check Jesus wrote in the cross has fully cleared. That our sin has been paid for. That it has been defeated. And this is, why, this is part of the reason why it's so critical for us as Christians to take the resurrection literally. Without it, we don't have any hope. That's what Paul says, you are still in your sins. Not only that, you're misrepresenting God. You're even in worse trouble. We gotta see that Christ was raised from the dead, literally. Otherwise, you're here for no point at all. It must be literal. I, I once heard 
on a, on a, on a TV show, some talk show. And they were talking, it was around Easter, and they were talking about how, you know, if, if, uh, if the bones of Jesus were some way discovered, what would that do to your faith? And there was some pastor who said, well, if they definitively proved that the bones of Jesus were, that they definitively proved that it was the bones of Jesus, then it wouldn't really matter to me because Jesus has been resurrected in my heart. And to that we say, dead wrong. Dead wrong. There is no joy. There is no hope. There is no grace. There is no nothing without the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what we feel in our hearts. Christ must be raised. Otherwise, everything falls apart, including the grace and the forgiveness and the mercy that we so long for. But if he is alive, Jesus has been raised from the dead, literally, then friends, those of you who have trusted in Jesus have every reason to feel safe before God, to know that your acceptance is sure. And this, my friends, is where astonishment can really begin to leak into our hearts. That the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees for you, through faith, a safe space in the presence of God. No more fear, no more shame, no more guilt, but rather the freedom of running to a father who loves you, who receives you, who wants you. Friend, because of the resurrection of Christ, you can believe with complete sincerity and in all truth that God takes your side. Does that not astonish anybody else? That though you've sinned against him, though you've run so far from him, that because of the blood of Jesus that's shown to be enough through the resurrection of Christ, you can have confidence before God. I think of this scene in, in Zechariah. And Zechariah the prophet is seeing this vision of the courtroom of heaven. And he sees Joshua, the high priest, standing before God in filthy rags. And someone's there, someone else. The vision shows Satan standing before God next to Joshua, accusing Joshua of what he has done. And does his, does his accusations, are they true? Probably, yeah. But does God receive them? How does God respond in that vision? He says, with nothing towards Joshua about his own guilt, he says to the accuser, the Lord rebuke you. Is this not a brand that I've plucked from the fire? God himself becomes the defender of the guilty. God himself becomes the defender of the dirty. And that's available for you today. You can have, because of the resurrection of Jesus, you can have every reason, every expectation that you will be received by God. That should, that should astonish us, friends. That should seize us with joy. There's nothing that can hold you back from God. There's nothing that can send you from his presence. That should seize us with joy. Third and final implication of the resurrection that hope is real. Listen to this from 1 Peter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Our final implication is that because of the resurrection of Christ, we are awakened, we are raised even, to a hope of inheritance. And what that means for us is that because of the resurrection of Christ, for the believer, the best is always yet to come. You can always, you can always expect the, your life when it ends and in your future to be good. 
You do not have to fear, but you can actually have hope. Now, hope at times is difficult, but it is the most, it is the most natural disposition when we consider the resurrection. When we think about the resurrection and we think about the inheritance that we've now been given through the resurrection, we can consider questions like, is the world meaningless? And we can say, no, Christ has been raised. We can, we can look at questions like, is my life going somewhere? And we can say, yes, Christ has been raised and will take me up with him. Is there a satisfying ending to the desperate story of humanity? Yes. Christ has been raised. To the believer, we can always answer these existential and nagging questions with hope because of the resurrection of Jesus. The world and its destruction and chaos will eventually have a satisfying ending. And the satisfying ending, the hope that we should all have as Christians, is what Peter calls an inheritance. That God will bring us into something that is beautiful and wonderful and give us something that will satisfy our souls forever. He will bring us out of this cold, dark existence and recreate the world full of beauty and joy. You can expect that. You can look forward to that. You know, here's the here's illustration. So yesterday, there's a Walmart in Factoria that is closing down. Anybody else go to this? Yes, you did. That's right. It's, let me finish the illustration. You won't go. Uh, so we, I, I waited in line yesterday uh, for a solid like hour and 20 minutes, maybe, maybe an hour. Maybe it's just it's bigger in my mind. And it was really cold, but I went because everything was 75% off at this Walmart. And we've been thinking about getting a new TV. Of course, I'm going to go, you know? And so I'm, I'm waiting in line, and I'm playing Candy Crush, and I'm kind of working on this sermon on my phone, and just waiting and standing in the cold and just like, man, this better be worth it. I want that TV so bad. And I get in there, and the only relief is that it's warm. <laughs> Everything picked through. Everything. <laughs> To where it was so picked through that I went in with the expectation of a new TV, but I walked around for so long trying to find something that I was so desperate that I looked and I said, oh my gosh, there's ant traps. We need those. <laughs> we, have, we have some ants. This is a win. <laughs> oh gosh. The, the expectation was drastically lowered once I went in there, but it was warmer than it was staying in the cold. That's for sure. And I wonder if that's how we think of our destiny with God eventually. And it's going to be slightly better. It'll, God will take us out of this cold existence where death and dying still exist. And he'll bring us into the warmth of life forevermore. But is it really going to be what we expect? Is it really going to be what we want? Yes, friends. The inheritance, what we will get as Christians, won't just be slightly better than what we now experience. It will be an inheritance, as Peter describes it, that is imperishable. No shelf life. No threat of losing it. It will be undefiled. Nothing can taint it. Everything about it is good, is pure, is lovely, is beautiful. It will be unfading, meaning unending. It won't be an inheritance or an experience that's eventually going to sputter out. But rather, the hopeful inheritance that we have as Christians is something that supplies itself. We won't, have to keep, we, won't, we won't have to keep it up or keep it going. We will experience it forever, and it will never decline from our taking of it. That is a wonderful future to look forward to. That will not let us down. All, friends, because of the resurrection of Christ. We've been born again. We've been wake, awakened to a living hope to look forward to. So Christ has overcome death. Victory has come. You can be assured of your forgiveness in Christ because Jesus was raised from the dead. And you can look forward to a wonderful future, a great inheritance that is worth hoping for. That should seize our souls, friends. How are we to respond to something so Wonderful, so glorious. 
There's many different ways. We might just be filled with confidence, which is good. Child of God, you should stand in confidence before him, without a doubt. You should have joy. You should have a sense of peace. But most of all, in, in, in reaction to this wonderful truth of what Jesus has accomplished in his resurrection, the first way that we respond the first way we let it seize our souls is through submission. With a, with a savior so great and with an invitation so large, the first reaction should be to bend the knee, to look to Jesus Christ and say, all hail King Jesus, you are worthy of my life. You are worthy of everything that I have. And when you do that, you can begin to see the beauty of Christ. I once read of this illustration of an artist who created a wonderful statue. And it was complex and beautiful. There was so much in it. And and people would would come to see this statue. And they would come to all different angles and try try to get a different view on this wonderful statue. And eventually, the artist gave an interview. And he was asked... How do you view the statue? And he said, the best way to view this work of beauty is kneeling in front of it. That's exactly what it means. That's exactly how we look at the beauty of Jesus Christ and his resurrected power. The best way to see it is to kneel before him. And after that, there's all kinds of confidence and joy and peace, but first we must Kneel, because in the Christian worldview, what naturally follows that initial sentence, Jesus has risen from the dead, is another short sentence, that Jesus is Lord. Because of the resurrection, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus alone is Lord. We will all eventually, willingly or unwillingly, confess that at the center of reality, the most important truth of all is the most important person of all, Jesus Christ. And you are invited, friend, into that submission to this great Savior today. Whether for the first time or the thousandth, to resubmit and say, Jesus, you are worthy of my life. Everything that you've done for me is worth submitting all to you. Imperfectly, yes, but continually to run to Jesus again and submit all to him. And so, friend, I I hope that you see the glory of Christ and his victory over death and the forgiveness of sins and the hope that you have. And I hope, friend, that you will not let this Easter holiday pass by without letting it seize your soul enough to make you bow before him. Let's pray. Jesus, we acknowledge that the most important reality is you, the most important person. That at your resurrection, the story of human history turned. And now, as we will celebrate just 40 days from now, you have been ascended into the heavens. And right now you reign, you rule, even in ways we might not see, you are running this world and you are bending the arc of history to land at that great confession that you alone are Lord. So Father, I, I pray that you would glorify your son in our hearts that we would see the beauty and the power of the resurrection. That it's not just routine. God forbid it is not cute and kitschy. It seizes us with astonishment to tremble before someone who's so great and yet so loving. God, give us the grace to submit to your son. For there we first and best see his great beauty. Give us faith in this way. 
In Jesus' name, amen. This teaching was recorded as part of our current sermon series at Icon Church. During our weekly gatherings, we move from the teaching to a time of response. While we recognize it may be hard to capture that as you listen online, we encourage you to take a moment to reflect on and respond to what the Spirit might be telling you in response to what you've heard. For more resources and to find out how you can join with us in gathering on Sundays, visit iconchurch.org. And as we say each week, Christ is all and we are His.